Welcome. This is probably the first video that you're watching, but it may not be. It's entitled Engaging Student Interest. And if you don't mind, I'd like to start with a story. So I was traveling alone by bus through the Andes Mountains in the late 1990s. This is a true, true story. And at one border crossing, for some reason, I was suspected as a drug smuggler. Uh, I was immediately transported to a military outpost and thrown into this dark room and a light was shown on my face and a high-ranking officer came in based on his uniform and began firing questions at me in Spanish and they wanted to know why my passport hadn't been stamped upon entering the country which is often a telltale sign of a drug smuggler apparently so they assumed that I was you know a typical smuggler from the US and I felt sure that I was gonna be thrown in jail and you know, for an indeterminate amount of time, save one fact, I spoke Spanish. So I explained to the officer that I was a geographer and a linguist and I was touring the area for fun and for research and that my passport wasn't stamped because I simply hiked across the border somewhere in the wilderness away from any official checkpoints. Uh, and apparently it, that worked because within about an hour, I had talked my way out of this snafu and I was free to go, paid a small fine. The point of the story is that language is power. And learning a new language can get you jobs, it can expand your social life and your worldview, and it can keep you out of jail even, as it did for me. That is the story that I told my first high school Spanish class on the first day. The first day that I ever really officially taught a class. I wanted them to get excited about learning a new language and to see the power that language holds. And rather than just beginning the day by plunging into a lesson or classwork, I began with that story. So I'll ask you to think back to the best lecture, talk, or presentation that you've seen or heard in recent memory. Do you remember how the speaker began the lecture or the talk? Almost always experienced teachers begin with a story or anecdote to warm up the audience. A talk on nutrition might begin by asking the audience what they had for breakfast. An animated filmmaker might ask, uh, you know, who likes to draw and what sort of things they draw. A physical therapist might begin a talk by asking audience members to point out sore or aching points on their bodies and giving them quick advice about how to remedy those issues. Maybe inspirational speakers might begin with a personal story and how they overcame their greatest challenge and transformed their lives. Teaching a lesson to your students is the same. And, you know, whether you realize it or not, you as a teacher are a professional speaker. All day long, you speak to, wrangle, guide, instruct, inform, organize, and connect with classes of various sizes. And the beginning of your lesson is the most critical portion. That's when your students decide if they'll give you their attention or not. It's when they start to judge if this will be interesting, useful, and pertinent, or a boring waste of time. So literally, the first minute of any lesson, lecture, or talk is the most important of all. And remember that your job as a teacher is threefold. Number one, your job is to engage student interest by relating the lesson to students' everyday lives so they have a hook in their mind. Number two, deliver the content of the day with maximum effectiveness. And then number three, your job is to create a meaningful context and help students process and integrate the content into their lives and into their minds. This video focus on, focuses on engaging student interest, so the first one of those three above. Future videos will cover the topics of delivering the content and helping students to process and integrate the content. So a common mistake that many new teachers make is skipping step one above engage in student interest and jumping right into delivering the content but this is really like driving to the airport airport excuse me before your passengers have gotten in the car it doesn't matter if you get there on time if your passengers aren't on board and actually i got that from my sister stephanie's high school teacher he used to say that and i loved that it doesn't matter you have to wait until your passengers get in the car before you go on your journey of the lesson expert teachers give significant attention to developing and enticing student interest 
whether it's culturally, personally, regionally, climatically, historically, biologically, in the topic of the day at the very beginning of the lesson. Okay, so what exactly are we talking about here? Begin with a story, begin your lesson with a story, a question, an image, or a statistic that is striking in some way. So this hook can be related to a common experience in the community, like a well-known person, a well-known location, issue, a point of pride. Uh, number two, it could be popular entertainment, so something that everybody would understand, a certain movie, a song, a TV show, a social media reference. Uh, it could also be an everyday sensory experience, like watching the sunset or eating dinner or talking with friends, something that basically everybody does. Uh, it could also be a popular goal or trend or desire or challenge for students in that community of that age. It's just anything that you they can relate to in their minds, where you can link to their minds and somehow bridge that later to the lesson. So let students really get into the theme that you bring up and let them talk about it, write about it, share stories about it, and get enthused about it. That's the point when they're excited and interested that you as the teacher can draw the connection from that shared experience to the lesson of the day. Now before I get to my sort of zinger of a story, here are a few general examples of what I'm talking about. So number one, you could ask students what they had for breakfast that day to introduce an agricultural lesson about how wheat, coffee, and eggs are raised, for instance. Number two, you could begin a Spanish language lesson. I did this once when I was teaching Spanish, Spanish about accents or tildes by asking students to come write their names on the board as everyone else tries to figure out which syllable of their name is emphasized. And once you get that concept down, then you can go into accents and tildes. Number three, ask if anyone has ever been camping and seen the Milky Way galaxy in order to contextualize a discussion about the size of the cosmos or the speed of light. Number four, before reading, say, Raisin in the Sun, ask students to write what they would do if they won $100,000 in the lottery, which is obviously a theme in that play. Number five, you could tell a personal story or anecdote, and it could even be a lengthy story that takes a few minutes to tell, as long as it's good. Uh, when you tell an engaging personal story with enthusiasm, the students connect to you and to the topic, so they're being more and more drawn in. You can even have a student volunteer tell a story. If you say, does anyone have a story about this? And that can be just as good. So one of my best examples of this occurred one day while I was substitute teaching in a high school English class at a very challenging inner city high school in California. When I stepped into the class, as students began filing in, I glanced down at the instructions for the day, thinking there'd be some workbook exercises or a video, but what I was asked to do that day was much more challenging. I was asked to introduce them to the work of Chaucer, the 14th century writer. And these are students who literally have to dodge bullets to get to school some days, and I'm supposed to convince them that a 14th century author, much less an author who wrote in Middle English, somehow relates to their lives. You know, if I would have launched in to the lecture by saying, today we're going to learn about a 14th century author in England, a majority of the class would have just tuned out immediately. So I tried a different approach. Teach me some slang words that you hear on the street that I probably don't know, I said to them. I'll write them on the board. Let's make a list of 15 or 20 common slang terms that you know. And their eyes widened and a forest of hands went up as others just blurted out words like janky, hoopty, trippin', hella, tight. Remember, this is Northern California. Some of those are Northern California words. I peppered them with little questions like, well, what does that mean? Is that a verb or a noun? And in what type of situation would you use that word? And, you know, I wanted real specifics. So eventually I asked, if all these words were a new independent language, what would it be called? And we eventually settled on Ebonics, which was the best general term that could, you know, uh, we all could agree upon. And this was around 15 years ago when that term was sort of more popular. So Ebonics, we agreed, was a street language with no real written form, spoken only on the street and also in certain artistic expressions like rap and some movies. But of course, English is the official formal language of our society. Um, and actually, a, a local San Francisco Bay Area, Bay Area rapper named E-40 had even composed an Ebonics dictionary, 
which I think is still available. So after they seemed satisfied with their glossary and a newly named unique language, I commented, you know, the same exact thing happened 600 years ago in England. And some quizzical looks popped up on their faces. It's true, I said, French was the official language in England, but a rough, unwritten street language was emerging among Germanic immigrants, the Angles, and it was called Anglish or English. And the first person to write published stories and poems in this language was named Geoffrey Chaucer. So he was like E-40, the rapper, a courageous voice from the back of the class guessed. I guess he was, I said. And my work for the day was done. Because from that moment on, they couldn't hear enough about Geoffrey Chaucer. And the point of this story is to illustrate that I had to begin with a story that related to the students' everyday lives. When I had their attention, transferring that attention onto the lesson of the day was easy. Okay, that is, uh, that's my good story on that topic. Let's do a few quick review questions and uh, so that we can process this. Okay, number one, pick an important lesson of yours and brainstorm ways to introduce it in an engaging way. How could you connect the content or themes to your students' lives? Write five ideas down without judging what pops into your head. Just get the ideas flowing. Choose one of those ideas that you think could be developed into a really engaging intro. What could you add to it to make it more visual, auditory, tactile, kinesthetic, or interpersonal? Just write everything that comes to you. What supplies might you need? Try this intro in a class. Pay attention to your students' body language and facial expressions to determine how effective it really is at engaging their interest. Revise it. Continue to try new ideas until you can see that you've got them. And now you take that technique and you can apply it to more lessons. And, and, and last, we would hope that you would report back and uh, share this with your online support community. Small tweaks really in our teaching can lead to big breakthroughs. So congratulations on your progress and seeing this perhaps your first video of this series. Uh, you're off to a great start. Your students will thank you. And that's the end of this first video.